Hey there, I'm Anthony from Deselect, and in today's interview, I will be talking with Danielle LaFay, Principal Insurance Solutions at Silverline. We have an in-depth conversation that I really enjoyed about some insurance use cases and how they can be best implemented in Marketing Cloud. There's a lot of practical takeaways here and inspiration for your own journeys. So if you have a question for Danielle, just put them in the comments, like always. And in the meantime, just sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hi, Danielle. Welcome to this series. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for having me today. It's uh, it's our pleasure. And um, as we were just discussing, it's great to see you showed up in uh, appropriate uh, attire. Yes, absolutely. I've got my Cody on. This is the Trailblazer community because um, I'm a group leader, um, have been for a long time. And I'm drinking out of my community Yeti and uh, I got all sorts of fun Salesforce swag. That's awesome. That's awesome. Could you actually uh, give us uh, a quick intro for our audience? Yeah, absolutely. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, my name is Danielle Laffey, and I work as a um, industry principal um, focused on insurance at uh, Silverline, who is a Salesforce partner, uh, implementation partner, and consulting partner. Um, so I'm at a director level there where I work with clients in the insurance uh, space specifically um, and kind of help them as uh, through advisory engagements all the way through their implementation and then even some additional supporting after the fact. Um, they use kind of the whole suite of, of Salesforce. My background is um, a solution architect originally. I've been in the ecosystem since 2003 and um, Marketing Cloud, exact target from back in the day, um, has been a big part of my life. That was my first job out of school, technically. Um, so I have um, extensive work on Marketing Cloud. Obviously, that was uh, exact target was purchased by Marketing or Salesforce and got turned into Marketing Cloud back in the day. And um, I also work pretty heavily with. Um, Sales, sales cloud, service cloud, uh, financial services cloud, um, especially as it relates to the insurance space um, and tying all of those together. And then uh, recently I just picked up Velocity too, so. So you're at the intersection of uh, mostly marketing cloud, but I hear you're also specialized in other clouds, but I think mostly marketing cloud, right? And uh, insurance, so how did that come to be? Um, actually, I just kind of fell into it. So I, um, I worked for a consulting partner prior to this, and uh, quite a few of our clients that I was um, getting assigned to were really large insurance companies, um, which right after the acquisition with Salesforce, um, started purchasing Marketing Cloud and using it for customer engagement um, and broker engagement, both. And so I, uh, knowing exact target Marketing Cloud so well from back in the day, um, I also um, had the luck of being able to be on the team that that wrote the original connector between sales cloud and marketing cloud from back in the day as well. Um, and so I knew how that worked kind of inside and out and um, got attached to these particular clients um, who are in the insurance world and helped them um, come out with email campaigns and journeys. And then eventually, you know, some of the other um, I go digital and, and those things got uh, enveloped into marketing cloud as well. Um, I knew the people who created those because they were all in Indian or most of them were in Indianapolis originally at the time, which is where I'm from oh. originally. And, oh, that's convenient. Uh, yeah, it was. It was very convenient. Yep. Um, that's kind of how, you know, growing up in Indiana and having Indianapolis, that's where I started out the exact target, um, you know, right out of school because it was easy and really big at the time. And, and mm. you pretty much everyone knew everyone um, back in the day. Now, obviously, it's not the same and I'm no longer in Indy anymore, but um so yeah, I, I just um, helped them figure out the information that they needed to have in their CRM um, and how we would bring that over into Marketing Cloud and what we would be able to use to segment out and um, you know create personalized customer engagement experiences. Um, so I've kind of been with the companies, especially as they've grown over the years. Um, you know, from a hey, I'm going to market and advertise to you, and that's what I'm going to use email for. Um, to, you know, full on engagement, transactional, uh, information, um, you know, obviously that personalization and segmentation, and then just here in the last few years, starting to go into some of those other, um, channels as marketing cloud has brought them into 
Right. Uh, it's 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 yeah. not just uh, outbound email campaigns anymore, right? It's a full customer experience, multi-channel strategy that you can uh, execute on Marketing Cloud. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, by the way, congratulations on being nominated as a uh, as a Salesforce Marketing Champion in 2020. Uh, what, is, what does that title mean to you? Thank you. Um, I... I have been an advocate around marketing. And again, uh, when we say marketing, really it is that customer engagement component and the customer experience and the communications that you're having in and around that and the messaging in and around that. Um, and I kind of, and I, I assume that most other marketing club folks probably feel this way. I've, I've had a lot of conversations with others about it. We kind of feel like we're the, the ugly stepchild of the Salesforce world. Um, you know, no one, no one really wants to learn marketing cloud in the Salesforce ecosystem because it's different um, mm. than, than some of the other uh, components or pieces. So when Salesforce came out with this, um, with the program for the champions um, for marketing specifically, it was I, I long, long time coming, I felt, and um, just wonderful to be able to elevate some of the people who really make the experience that all of the consumers are having so great, right? They're, they're the way that you can actually keep up with those Googles and, and things of the world. And if you didn't have them in your staff and you didn't have the, the marketing cloud suite um, available to you, then, um, you know, you're going to have some issues. So, um, so it was wonderful to actually be nominated and, and put into that class. It was the first class and it was just awesome to finally get some recognition for the hard work that all of the marketing cloud people are doing um, out there in the world. And Hard audit as well. I don't want to to say that it's you know completely marketing cloud because uh, part, part, <laughs> yeah, part of this may be the stepchild for yeah. Part of this maybe the stepchild for the exact targeters. Ooh, be careful of that one, sir. I don't know who's listening right now, but you could get some uh, some angry people on that one. But yeah, oh, uh, <laughs> I, I saw an interview with Adam Blitzer not too uh, not too long ago, and apparently the Pard Pardodians they had a nickname. They had a very strong culture, apparently. They do, they do, um, and it's it's also a really great tool, right? Um, you, you, I think that there's room for both of them actually um, in in the implementations, and I've actually um, used it for used both of them in implementations in the past um, with some right. of the advisory that I've done. So, yeah, don't don't get me wrong; it was actually part of that got me rolled in, rolling into marketing cloud later. So that I, I started from that part. Uh, from oh, that there you go, there you go, and. Cool. Um, since you were uh, uh, you were a community leader in Indy, right? So, uh, what was it like to uh, to be the community leader for Marketing Cloud, where Marketing Cloud was headquartered? Um, pretty awesome, actually. So, I originally um, got put into the leadership role. I actually was handed Salesforce, and they said, "Hey, go make this work." And I was like, "How on earth am I going to do that?" Uh, I was like, "Do you have training for me?" And they're like, "Of course not, no." And um, and my boss had actually told me to go find a user group or start a user group. And I said, I don't even know what a user group is. And uh, <laughs> I called Salesforce and lo and behold, there were four user groups globally at the time. Oh, wow. So I connected with the Minneapolis one um, and kind of got their formatting and things in place and um, applied for Salesforce and became the fifth user group globally. Um, and we had, we, we had a, it, it took a little bit to get going at first. I had a core group of people who came really frequently, um, in the, in the organization, you know, it was a handful of people at the time. Um, and it took a couple of years for me to actually build it up, but we ended up having over goodness. It was over a thousand users, um, who mm -hmm. were part of the group overall and we consistently were getting somewhere between um, 50 and 75 people who would come every single month or every other month, depending on whenever it is that we held the meetings. Um, so that was really awesome. And the community and sharing, even job, job um, jumping, if you will. Um, and it, it's, it's been, it was a really wonderful, wonderful experience um, to actually watch it grow over time. And, as I go to Dreamforce and things now, and they have uh, information for, you know, uh, information sessions for user group leaders, they always have people who've been around for a long time, you know, the last one standing kind of thing. Um, and it's really fun to be like one of the only last ones standing. Um, mm. it, it's the, the community has really blown up over the last year or two, um, which is awesome. Um, just a lot of connections and 
um, it's been fantastic. So I, I led that group in Indianapolis for up until I'm, I actually now live in Tampa and moved here about a year and a half ago. Um, and so I continued kind of my, my last year term um, there last year. So I, I led that for about 13 years in total. And then um, I just recently uh, took over the insurance group globally. So um, we still talk about Marketing Cloud, actually. Um, and I have people who come in and talk about um, the marketing and customer engagement. And obviously, um, in the insurance world, how are you not just talking to your end consumers, but the big deal right now is agents and brokers and how right. you can engage them, right? Especially the independent ones. Um, and all the different use cases that I've been able to use in and on there. So it's been it's been awesome. And I've definitely had some amazing people who have helped me along the way um, to get to the place where I am. Uh, I would not have been able to do it with, I had a co-leader, um, Mike Martin at the time. Um, he did it with me for several years and he was one of the, that core group who originally came and I would not, um, we would not have been as successful without some uh, key, key people um, putting in into the okay. community, which is what it's all about. I'd love to jump in a bit more in those uh, insurance uh, use cases, actually. But before we get there, you mentioned you now lead the, the insurance user group, and it's a global group. It is, yes. So um, I, every now and then we have some people who um, hop in from um, the from EU, um, where you are located, or uh, I have a couple of people from Aust Australia who come in every now and then. Um, yeah, there's a surprising amount of uh, SFMC users in Australia, we can tell from yeah. our readership and so on. Yeah, so um, it's great to have them. You know, I, I normally do them uh, around noon Eastern time. Um, and it's awesome to have people like joining in at two o'clock in their morning their time just to like listen to a really cool topic. Mm. It's like, you know, you've, you know, you've nailed the topic down when you've got people uh, coming in at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, the, yeah, they're very, <laughs> uh, very fanatic. Um, actually, since it's a global group, does that mean there's a lot of commonalities in insurance across the globe or are there differences? Um, I do think that there are some differences. I will say, um, you know, depending on the lines that you're looking at, uh, you know, PNC um, insurance has, I would say globally, um, a little bit more similarity than like health as an example. Um, right. oh, health yeah. here in the United States, obviously very different than it is in the EU and some of the other um, countries where the uh, the government system is a little bit different than um, the United States. So um, so working through that and figuring out their policy admin systems and, and who's buying insurance and who's responsible for it and, you know, all the different policyholder information and um, how do you communicate and do you or I and our family together or household? How do you household all those people together? And mm. um, that is a, a a challenge that is definitely seen more so, I think, in the United States than it is some of the other places, just from the way that we we do the health um, insurance. But we also have third parties for, you know, the life insurance and some of the annuities um, and things as well that um, are a little bit more, I guess, traditional um, in that sense. So right. And, and yeah, the way the government's organized definitely different, though. I think the world's been watching very closely for the last season when uh, where there was the elections uh, in, the, oh, in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, um, I am. I am glad that election uh, season is finally over. Um, we'll see if it actually is completely done at this point or not. Um, there's definitely some fighting still going on over here about who gets to be elected and who's not elected. But <laughs> so, we'll so we hear you. <laughs> so we hear and um and what was it about the the, the household uh, thing that you mentioned and is this in the way you um you want to address the people of a household and what kind of communication you can send them or could you clarify that um a little bit of all of it actually so um the concept of householding has come up in in the salesforce crm um specifically um, in the health cloud and in uh, financial services cloud. And then you can actually take that information and, and very easily pull it over into marketing cloud to make sure that you are um, communicating to the appropriate people in the household. But it's, it's really the thought of Danielle and Dan are married. And um, if they're married and they have children under them or they have a sister under them, um, how are they tied together in that household? And if they have 
um, you know, there's, there's a lot of split families these days. So there might be a household where a child is, is sitting there or a beneficiary in the insurance world um, that were dependent um, in, the, in the health side of things. Um, you know, how, how are you tying it to that person? Is it a secondary? Do they actually get to be on certain policies? Um, what kind of information can you talk to them? from a segmentation perspective to actually onboard them or, you know, try and sell information to them, um, being able to understand if they have, you know, multiple people in their family, um, you know, the, the demographics behind it um, as you're trying to target out uh, and segment your personalization for selling or up, upselling um, opportunities is, is definitely um, something that is new, newer, I would say, to, um, to the marketing world um, right. because we're now just finally getting to the point in the last couple of years where we can actually do householding um, and be able to get a true picture of what that actually looks like so that you can um, message to them appropriately through all the different channels. Interesting. Yeah, because households are not um, self-evident anymore these days, I can imagine. In Dutch, we even have a specific phrase for this that goes something along uh, like um, newly composed families for like, let's say, oh. to, yeah, to, uh, <laughs> to uh, a husband and a spouse that had former marriages, they get together, bring the kids together. So that would be like a, a newly composed um, family. Yes, yes. Um, and that is kind of, it's just the reality of the world now, right? It's, there is no longer uh, a mom and a dad, two and a half kids and a half of a dog or whatever it was that, right. that we used to have um, from an average family perspective. It's, it's just changed. It's different. And um, being able to make sure that you're communicating to those people appropriately um, and understanding who your consumers are so that you can actually take the back end of some of that segmentation as well um, and understand uh, how you need to improve your customer service or how you need to improve your products. Um, that you're selling into those consumers. Uh, absolutely. And you've mentioned the word segmentation a few times, which obviously is a topic close to my heart. Um, it, it strikes me when talking with different industries that insurance segmentation is of particular interest. It's, uh, it's probably because cross-sell is just so key to how the whole business model operates, mm -hmm. I think. Um, so it makes sense to make segments to see, if, okay, this customer already has health insurance, but not yet a, whatever you name it, car insurance. Um, is that also how you see it? And what kind of segmentation do you see happening? So there's, there's really, um, well, depending, depending on the insurance uh, vertical that you're in, you know, whether you be in health, health insurance and providing um, actual health information to people, or um, if you're, you know, attempting to try and do bundles around uh, PNC, so car insurance and, and um, home insurance. Uh, Sorry, could you just maybe clarify the, the phrase PMC? Not everyone on of the audience may be familiar with it. Oh, yeah. So it's your um, it's your basic uh, commercial insurance, specifically like personal liability insurance um, right. around your your home, your um, li uh, liabilities for um, tangible items, um, if you will. So, Got yeah. It. Um, so there's, there's a couple of different audiences now, um, that the insurance companies are going after. So as an example, I had a really large, um, insurance client that was selling, um, they had auto insurance, home insurance, renter's insurance. Um, and so being able to segment out and understand, Hey, this person has car insurance, um, with us. We know what their address is. We know that they are in, um, in, based on the research that you can do from an address perspective, you can understand if they're in a complex or a home or not. And then you can actually segment out messaging to say, hey, we have renter's insurance and you can get um, a discount on this, or we've got home uh, insurance and you can get a discount on this as well. Um, I mean, that's very rudimentary and basic, but um, that's kind of where seg some of the segmentation goes into. Um, on the agent and broker side is really where it starts mm. to get kind of fun. I was um, going to ask. Yes. <laughs> so I actually created, um, this was a, for a, a fairly large um, insurance carrier. Um, they were looking for a way to take all of their independent brokers and make them more successful. So as you were onboarded onto the company as a new agent, day one, you started to get into a marketing cloud journey. And um, the journey ended up being in a year long. And there was about oh, 175 yeah. touch points that were built into the journey. 
Um, is, that a, is that a single journey? Because I think the thing will just crash or... <laughs> well, when I originally, uh, when we originally did it, yes, it was. Um, since then, we, we, you know, they've broken it apart. And, you break and it up. Different ones. But in the original, um, the original launch of it, it was one great big, huge journey um, where it would look at several different areas, um, which is where kind of some of your... Um, segmentation, not just from the contact information that's in uh, Journey Builder, but also being able to pull information in from um, your policy admin system um, so that you can know and understand how much this information um, has been sent to certain people. Um, they, they were able to roll up information to help an agent understand from um, like what they're selling, what they could be selling, what additional people um, they could be offering to other customers. You know, your consumers are, are purchasing this. We've seen like things that do this. You should offer them this um, based on who their people are, who have policies that are associated to that particular agent that was out there, um, which really is, is the ability to basically find the leads for them, right? And so you're just putting money in their pocket at that point. Um, but all, obviously it's, um, helping the, the carrier at the end of the day as well. So, um, there was, there was a ton of different personalizations around some of the emails or texts, um, that were being sent out, um, just to kind of help them through the journey of, Hey, did you know this particular tool was out there and available? I've noticed that you haven't used it, um, all the way through, um, you know, some of the other things that I mentioned around hey, you have these people and you should be selling them this, this, and this, or have you thought about doing this instead? Um, where it's really coaching the people through. Um, and it was a, a year long cycle. Uh, it obviously took a little bit of time to get it through the entire, entire cycle. And again, that's when they started to break it apart. Um, but they had some amazing insights hmm. about, their, um, about their independent brokers. And it actually um, created more independent brokers because people wanted that. Um, they heard about it from, you know, additional people in the, the industry and ended up being able to bring on some more agents because they wanted something, oh. some help as well, right, from a recruiting standpoint. Um, okay, and then it also okay. continued to retain them, um, as well as, you know, obviously adding on products and, and upselling all of their um, individual policyholders too. So it was kind of a win-win for everyone and um, a really cool way to to use segmentation uh, and personalization with marketing cloud in the industry space. Um, I guess so it, it, it was a journey. Years. Sorry, it was a journey that good that it actually impacted the job market. It actually fully impacted. I mean, not just a little, but there was some major impacts. Yeah. So it was really cool. All right. It's, I think the first time I hear a journey that big over a whole year. Um, but I, I'm, I sh I'm sure that it helped to break it up. I remember journeys with even a few dozen steps where it, things get, uh, start getting pretty slow. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think journey builder at this point has been, you know, rebuilt four times now, three or four times now, uh, in the back end. So, um, it, it definitely hit some glitches along the way, but, um, but yeah, it was, that was a really cool one, um, that I got to work on. And it's very powerful though. Uh, so it's definitely one of the stronger, uh, points of marketing cloud. I think most people yeah. really like the capability. Um, yeah, other use cases that, that I've heard, and again, in, in insurance in particular, um, and then in particular on the B2B side, um, are things like, uh, uh, actually, this one was from a national insurance company in, in the US. So um, they had a few larger agencies, and then they had several products. And it ended up in this complex matrix where, depending on the new, uh, sometimes even uh, legally uh, necessary communication that it needed to happen, they had to prioritize who could get which communication exactly in a certain order and it ended oh, yeah. up in this in this kind of uh, waterfall segmentation scheme so like these people yes and then of the leftover people sent them the other communication of these leftover people sent them the other communication and uh, and so on yeah that's actually been a new um over the they have the orchestration i don't remember what the name of that one is called actually um, I remember the partner that actually does it now. It's Thunder Thunderhead, um, and that now they've they've renamed the cloud specifically for the orchestration of that. But um, oh, uh, in, in Interaction Studio, but now it's um, it's no longer Thunderhead. It's uh, it was the uh, acquisition of Evergage that actually 
the name of the Salesforce product has remained, which is Interaction Studio, but the underlying tech has actually. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, cool. but that can do that can do it. Uh, I mean, for sure, Evergage is definitely positioned often in insurance, especially on the personalization. But that's on the website side. It's on the on the back. That's how we know, of course. It's on the back end side that um, you need some kind of uh, segmentation on your first uh, party data. So that's where we sometimes come in, and then we see yeah. those waterfall segmentation use cases. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Um, yeah, I know that there's a lot of our consumers now, because again, if you sign up for something, it seems like the over communication that you get from companies sometimes is a little much. Um, there is a specific retail company that I can think of that I'm pretty sure I get at least four messages from them every day <laughs> um, about coming to buy a sweater or a pair of jeans. And it's a little, it's, it's a lot, right? So you kind of desensitize to it at that point. So I think yeah. the orchestration of determining um, which messages are most relevant, um, I, I absolutely love it. And it's something that I continually see people like, hey, we want to hit them on these couple of things, but I don't want it to just be a frequency thing. Originally um, in Marketing Cloud, it was, oh, you know, I can hit, hit you five times and then I'm going to stop emailing you. Well, what if that sixth email is the most important email, you know, exactly of all times? What if it means that, yeah. So, so, um, and having, having the, cons the, the customer as I'm working with them, my customer client, um, having them be able to tell me what those rules are and what messages are most important versus not, um, has been uh, an interesting challenge actually, because they don't really know. They're like, well, I want them all. I want them to see everything. Um, so kind of coaching them through how to segment them a little bit better, is, um, is, is something that I've worked with them a lot on. It's tricky because, um, for a while, uh, people were pushing preference centers very hard and, and they still play a, a useful role, I think. But I also recall a study that, that looked into these preference centers and how often people would actually update their preferences. And it turns out it's not that often, whereas people right. would. Yeah, where companies would actually invest a lot of money in, into building preference centers. Oh, yeah. We do custom preference centers a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, it makes sense at the surface, but I think you also need to uh, evaluate. Like you said, some customers really want all the communications. And uh, will customers actually manage their preferences? Um, uh, I'm, I'm not decided yet. I don't know if you have a certain opinion on this point. Um, I think it depends on the industry and I think that it depends on the options that you have in your preferences. Um, I've seen some people who have, you know, frequency versus, um, versus specific topics. And I right. would say that the frequency ones are not really used as much. Um, I, I want to know what's relevant to me and my preferences of topics that are relevant to me. I don't, I, if the topic isn't relevant to me, I don't want it. I don't care if you're sending it to me once a month, once a week, or every other hour. Um, I still don't want it because <laughs> it's not relevant. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and besides, um, this actually ties in to something you mentioned earlier. Um, like on many projects I did for a long time, there was this trend of uh, introducing marketing pressure or avoiding marketing fatigue or saturation or whatever uh, term was used. So the idea of not sending too many comps, but it's like, it's like you said, what if the sixth email is the most important one? How are we going to know? I, I haven't seen many good implementations of that that actually work. Yeah, I, I um, so I, I've been in the insurance vertical, but I also did um, a decent amount of um, just financial services in general. Um, and there was a credit card company that I was working with and they were very adamant about the fact that they were only sending five emails a week. Um, and once they hit five emails, they were done. And I said, well, what if that sixth email is that, you know, my credit card has been breached. I personally, as the end consumer, want to know that, right? Right. Um, has information in and around that. And I get that there's the, the thought between transactional versus, you know, marketing emails. Um, yeah. that, that definitely comes into play a little bit. But there are some messages that, you know, I, I think that are, are more relevant and understanding what really that is when you're putting together your communication strategy and the types of messaging that you're pushing out there um, is pretty important. Also, you know, there's a lot of things that I don't want to get in the email. I want to get it on my phone, right? So you need to be sending me text messages on it, or um, maybe that's something that's more relevant for a push, um, a push message that comes in the app that we're using to collect data because I'm actually in the app at that point in time, or I'm trying to get you to come into the app and interact with it. Um, 
those kind of things. So. And this distinction between, um, you said you call it marketing emails and transactional emails. I think some people also uh, call it commercial communication versus transactional communication, whatever it may be. Is it the distinction you've used a lot on projects at clients? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say the majority of people, um, again, going back to that customer engagement and me being a, a kind of a proponent for it, um, and knowing and understanding what the best uh, customer experience is. Um, I would say the majority of customers when they are buying Marketing Cloud, it's because they think, oh, I'm gonna send them emails and sell them more stuff. Right. And they don't right. really think on the back end um, all of the different use cases that you can use Marketing Cloud or Pardot um, for in order to, you know, from a customer service perspective, from sending out surveys, from you know, if you go and buy something or update something, or especially in the insurance world, policy data, um, when you update a policy or update beneficiary information, um, any of that kind of stuff is considered transactional and can be sent and tracked um, and be able to be put onto, especially with the connector, be able to be put onto a contact record where you can actually see all of the communications. I mean, how wonderful is it for uh, uh, somebody sitting in a call center when Danielle calls in to ask about her policy information that she knows the exact emails that I'm referring to and she can see them. Right. And she, I mean, that's, or, you know, text messages or whatever the messages that I've received, um, the ability to actually see that information on the spot, know that it was just sent um, so that you know what offer they've been, they've been given or the transaction that just happened, et cetera. That's um, what a CRM should do, right? Right. Yes. And, um, and I would say that there's definitely some additional education of the use cases around uh, what you can use um, a powerful tool like Marketing Cloud for. It's way above and beyond, um, hey, let me sell you my product. Well, we've been discussing the nitty gritty of Marketing Cloud projects a lot. And, and as, love as, I love, um, as much as I love geeking out about it, um, given your role at Silverline, I was actually kind of curious about how, um, how you at Silverline uh, tackle Marketing Cloud projects. How I tackle them? Yeah, is there something uh, particular about the sil silver line way? Silver line way. Well, um, I would say we we rarely ever do a marketing cloud project as a standalone project. Most of the time, it's an implementation um, that has a connection with um, either the Salesforce uh, CRM um, portion of things, whether that be the Health Cloud or FinServe. So um, at Silverline, we kind of not to say that we don't do any other projects, right? But we specialize um, in the industries of healthcare and of um, financial services. So on the financial services side, we're doing banking, wealth management, et cetera. Um, coming in and really understanding the use cases around how you want your user experience to be um, from an end consumer perspective and the information that you're trying to get from there really actually helps build the backbone for what in data you're going to be putting into your CM and how you're building that out. Um, and I would say that I've worked with other clients before and um, with, with other consulting firms and not to say that that's um, not key, but I feel like we in the specific industries that we sit in um, kind of have best practices or, Hey, this is what we recommend that you, that you, the information that you do put in here um, or these particular features or, or data sets that you do use um, so that we don't have to start from scratch every time, which um, I will say is a, a, a pretty big um, plus when it comes to oh, yeah. approach for, for marketing cloud and um, you know just customer engagement in general with when you- uh, I, I do agree that like the internal knowledge and methodology you build up in a consulting firm can make all the difference. Like some consulting firms really would have to start from scratch when they would get a certain project. Yeah, I um, the, I think the most frequent question that I have when we're going through discovery from my clients is, well, what do your other clients do? Precisely. And so being able to um, to have a, rep um, a repository of all that information for our, for our people to be able to go and pull from is really key in being able to, um, to implement with great success because Let's be honest, most of us uh, learn the best when we fall. Uh, <laughs> I actually, uh, my, I had a boss once who said, um, I need you to push so hard that you fall on your face and I will be here to pick you up. But that means that we're moving at a pace that's, you know, really amazing. And, and I, um, 
I do believe that you learn just as much, if not more from your mistakes. And so being able to understand, Hey, we've got, you know, 15 years of, of knowledge across seven different uh, consultants. Just think of all that wealth of oops and gotchas and, Oh, I broke that and won't do that again. You know, kind of thing that, that you can have um, when approaching projects. Exactly. And uh, actually in your space, we had a client like that. Um, we, uh, we currently, we, we just recently, I think this morning or yesterday morning, we published a success story, a video testimonial of um, Almbrand, which is a, an insurance firm in uh, Denmark. And they had, they've been one of the longest marketing cloud customers in, in Denmark, as far as I know. Oh, cool. Um, not, not nearly as long as any customer in the US though, mind you, uh, exact targets market share only grew in, uh, I think since the acquisition really. Uh, in Europe, yeah. that is. Um, but they also went through many motions of uh, trying, for instance, audience builder, uh, SQL queries. They had their architects full-time supporting uh, marketers, which is not really, you know, an architect's job is typically not marketing ops. Um, tried Query Studio. And, uh, well, I, I think you can guess where they ended up with. So um, I think, yeah, there's definitely a learning curve. And then especially if you're if you're a consulting firm that is just specialized in this one niche, this one problem that that accumulates for sure. Yeah. Um, I, I would say another thing that's a little bit, I don't want to say different, um, but maybe I, I found it to be a little bit different uh, in the way that Silverline approaches it versus some of the other maybe larger um, partners that are out there is um, the way that we try and set our customers up for them to be able to administer things when we leave. Um, and, you know, deselect, I think, is one of the tools that most clients don't have somebody on staff who can sit there and write SQL query. And I will definitely exactly. say that, um, that it's not in the marketing world, right? Like <laughs> when no. you walk, in, when you walk into their marketing operations, they've got, you know, creative web designers and, um, and people who make beautiful, uh, emails and people who are, who are writing uh, text, text message, you know, messaging and those kinds of things. But, when it comes to, hey, I need you to go into this SQL database and write some SQL out so that I can send this to a specific thing. Um, you know, they're deer in headlights and are like, how on earth are we gonna support this going forward? Yeah. And, you S know, we, SQ do have, <laughs> we do have the ability to support them um, should they choose to and they, and they don't want to go and hire for it. But, um, but being able to help them get the tools and the processes put in place so that they can actually administer it when we leave um, that's, I, I would say, um, something that's a little bit unique, um, for us at this point too. So, and by the way, um, before I forget also for the people who are listening, we'll make sure we add, uh, some URLs to Silverline and some other things we've been talking about, like the Indie group and so on in, the in the comments and in the description of the YouTube video or LinkedIn, wherever you uh, may be watching from. Um, but Daniel, let's take a step back again, uh, talking about marketing cloud in general, um, are there some things that really stand out for you in the platform that you really like? What are your favorite things of it? Um, I mean, I would say journey builder is pretty amazing. Um, I, and maybe that's cause it's near and dear to my heart. And I was one of the first people to use it. And, um, oh. back in the day, um, please elaborate. Yeah. One of the companies that their consulting firms that I worked for um, actually was built Journey Builder um, as part of part of Exact Target right before it got um, acquired, and so um, I got to play with it a lot. And just the ease of use of it, and it's gotten a million times better over the last you know at, over the last few years, and even over the last year and a half. Sometimes I go in there and I'm like, wait, when did this come about? Um, but I think the, the ease of use of being able to drag and drop and, and really see and understand what your engagement looks like on the page, um, I think is, is really powerful. Um, so I would say that that journey builder is probably my favorite tool to play with in there. Do you also have a least favorite one? Oh, um, Wow. Or l l let's say a less favorite one. That's maybe more uh, politically correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I don't know if it's still protected or not, but um, I did try and learn Audience Builder um, on me specifically learning it. Um, and I ran into a lot of challenges with it. Um, I, I think that I am not a coder. Um, and I think that I, I definitely appreciate the ability to do quick 
you know, click configuration and, and those kinds of things versus um, having to go in and, and read code to try and figure out if your query is working right or, or, or what's wrong with um, the particular audiences that you have. And when you're getting loads and loads and loads of data in there, it, I, I would say that that is probably my least favorite one at this point. I would also, actually, I, I have one that I don't like even more. Um, their surveys aren't that great either. <laughs> the surveys, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I, they do have them, um, but I most of the time always tell my clients like, you probably should consider a, a third party um, survey tool of some sort and, you know, just bring it in the back end with um, some of the DEs that you can throw it into a data extension. And right. I mean, surf, surfing is, is, is a very specialized thing anyway. So, yeah. But, but yeah, now I think with. <laughs> but but although now I think it could be interesting to use um was it the movable ink acquisition that they did uh so you now can have interactive email so people can can give basically do form inputs inside an email uh so in theory you could do like very simple surveys in an email and, and it could be sent back uh straight to marketing cloud I haven't used that particular feature at this point I, yet. I haven't used it I only looked at it but the screenshot I'm gonna really have nice. to go check that <laughs> out um yeah that might actually be something that would be workable indeed indeed but like as so many things if you need something really specialized like surveys or whatever it may be you're going to need a specialized tool i mean as as as, as good as the promise of a single platform for all purposes sound in reality you, you do have to need uh, you need some specific tools i think yeah for mm -hmm. sure on the audience builder side, by the way, I don't think it's even sold anymore. Um, uh, until recently, I, I still saw it pushed a little bit in the, in, um, uh, in the EU market. But when I told this to um, an Australian partner of ours, they, uh, they went like, huh, is that thing still alive? So, uh, oh, really? so yeah. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. What, um, do you have a favorite? What's your favorite one? In marketing cloud? Um, uh -huh. Yeah, I'm going to be really not original here. I'm going to go for journey builder as well, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, because it has so much flexibility, and then in the late in the later years, they had some some nice features you could update back to um, to Salesforce CRM or whatever core product you were using. Um, oh yeah, and, that's key. Yeah, indeed, and um, yeah, possibilities are endless. It really really um, depends on the creativity of the marketer. I do think though, like even for Journey Builder, you're still gonna have you still want someone involved who um, maybe not necessarily like a data manager, but a marketer who at least gets data a little bit. Um, it'll help, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, from your experience, what do you think can be improved in marketing cloud that would, that would benefit, uh, your clients or you? Oh, goodness. Um, I, I, I'm going to go back to data again. Right. Um, I think there's a lot of people who don't necessarily understand how to easily, um, fix move data, segment data out, be able to create lists. Um, the wonderful thing about Marketing Cloud is that it's so flexible that you can throw all these data extensions in and do all this data. And that's also the worst thing, right? Um, because if you get <laughs> so much flexibility, um, then you can get to the point where it's over your head and you break it a little bit. So um, I, I would say if there was any uh, improvement would be around, um, you know, not, not having it not having to go and write code, if you will, in order to get mm -hmm. some of the things out, and making it so that's a little bit more configurable um, to a, a layman's person. Um, as Good a think there's an app exchange for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what, what's that one called again? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, and, and that's the, the, the beauty, I think, of Salesforce, even though there may be some, some gaps in, in their offering, as would be for any product, where it be Adobe or Marketo or Eloqua, um, Salesforce ecosystem is simply the most open one. So you can, um, it's easy for, for other ISVs like ourselves, independent software vendors, ISV, uh, to, to build products for that, to fill that gap. And so sometimes I actually, I actually have customers or, 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 uh, hires ask me like, how is it possible that you guys exist? And, uh, well, you know, because, uh, Salesforce is counting on guys like us to, to come in and, and, and fix some things. Oh, totally. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of clients who, who don't really necessarily understand that. And I will say that um, Salesforce does a wonderful job of uh, selling it that anyone can do it. It's just, you know, all you got to do is this and this and you're done. And, you know, it's magic. Um, magic links is something that people talk about a lot. Um, like, magic, oh, links. Well, magic links. So I, I, I click this thing 
and or click this link and all of a sudden like this entire personalized thing opens up in a whole nother place for me that's exactly where I want it to be and it's like well how did you think that that link was built <laughs> oh right so like uh, like the, the, the slack um when you want to uh, log in with slack or you register for the first time they also call it a magic link yeah okay got it I'm fol- I'm following. Okay. Hey, as we, as, as we round up, uh, I think it would make sense to ask a community leader like yourself uh, the following. Uh, what would you recommend to people who are just starting their career with uh, Marketing Cloud? Oh, trailhead, trailhead, trailhead. Um, okay. that, that is definitely the first place that I would tell you to go. Um, they, you know, they've done a really wonderful job with some of the content that's out there in the trail mixes. Um, and they've even got a little bit more creative these days. I know that there's some people, you, you don't get a sandbox, unfortunately, right? There's a, in some of the other items in Trailhead, you actually get like a playground where it's a, a, a dev box and you can go and play with things. Um, unfortunately, Marketing Cloud doesn't have that, um, that feature or functionality yet at this point. And um, based on a couple of the calls that I've recently had with the Champions Group, I don't know that that's ever gonna necessarily be a thing that's gonna happen. Um, but they still have done a wonderful job with the content, um, the videos that they show, the training videos, um, that are in and along with those trailheads and trail mixes. So, um, that is definitely a place that I would start off first. Um, there are a couple, uh, I would definitely get involved in your community group. Um, we've just renamed them again. Um, so the marketing one, it used to be like marketing B to C and marketing B to B. And now I think it's back to, um, just plain marketing again. Um, yeah, or there's a the B2C was supposed to be marketing cloud and the B to B was supposed to be Pardot. Mm-hmm. And really that, you know, you can, you can do both, right? I, I can absolutely positively, um, market to, um, to businesses using marketing cloud and kind of vice versa with Pardot, I can absolutely um, go to end consumers. Now, that wasn't the original intent of either of the tools, but um, anyway, um, I I would definitely recommend going to a group. Um, I know that in COVID times these days, um, there isn't as many people who are meeting in person, but I'll tell you, um, uh, sharing stories, uh, we've been going through Zooms and and bevies and go to meetings and those kinds of things in order to do this. um, just the, sh- the, the knowledge share, um, is a huge component, um, to be able to, to understand what you want to do, especially if you're just getting started, maybe you're, um, going and trying to become an admin or something. Um, I'm trying to think there is specific blogs that are out there. I can get you a list of a couple of them that are really good, that are written by a couple of the, of my fellow marketing champions um that well uh, we had uh gortonington on the show for instance who was uh, promoting uh how to sfmc that was, uh, oh, was a good one there I think. you go yeah um uh, so i would definitely go and you can actually there's a marketing champions page where you can find all hundred ish of us um out there and when you go to that you can see where we work what our our um, specific areas of interest are there's pictures of all of us um and then you can click on us and that takes you to our subsequent information. So like, I think I go to the Silverline blog um, because I don't have my own actual blog, but there's a lot of people who have their own blogs and things. And um, Uh, I'm uh, I'm pretty sure that's uh, how Alina, our our marketer, you know her, uh, how how she found you through that page. (laughs) So so we'll make sure we link up the page also in the description. I'm pretty sure it's going to be a long list of resources, but that's great. Um, Um, on the on the Trailblazer side, one uh, bonus question here. Kind of curious um, uh, if you uh, have worked with. Um, I'm, I'm digging for the name of the platform exactly, but there's a version of Trailblazer that can be used for clients to build their own learning modules. Have you, Trail, have you seen? Um, Trailblazer.me. Uh, is this one where you can post your own trainings? Because I think there's a paying yeah. version. There there's is. Like a, there's a. Um, Trailblazer.me, is, I think that's what it's called, Trail, trailhead.me. And there's a, um, yeah, you can create your own trails. So if you're a company um, and you can go in and create your own content and then actually put that into your Salesforce org and have an, uh, push it out via community and then have people go in and take those trails, know and understand what they, um, 
worked on um, the information that they, if they passed or not, you know, depending on how you set up the trail, you can say that it's a certain amount of questions. They can get points, they can get badges, those kinds of things. And you can um, have a full on dashboard that goes along with it. Yeah, Silverline actually um, did a couple of those. Um, and we have one internally. That's actually how we onboard all of our people now um, is we've created yeah. our own trails. Um, and so you have to go through the Silverline trail. Um, you meet our CEOs and you meet our leadership team and you learn about all of the uh, particular items. So yeah, they, they absolutely do that as well. Fantastic. Yeah. Cause we have some trailing, um, training videos online and on our support portal, but, uh, we'd be very interested to, um, to consider having like a, a DC like trail. I think that would make sense for both partners and for customers alike and, and for yeah. our own internal resources, as you pointed out. Yeah, of um, course. Cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the tip. Uh, any closing thoughts you would like to share with our audience? Um, give Marketing Cloud a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Open your heart. <laughs> Open your heart to the customer engagement. Um, make sure that you're always keeping your uh, end consumer, whichever, whoever that is, whether it be, you know, somebody out of business or if it's somebody who is, you know, just a, a you and the end consumer from a retail perspective. Um, keep their personas in mind. I think that personas are incredibly important um, and that user experience and what you're communicating to them and um, uh, just making sure that you keep all that information in mind and uh, make sure that you're segmenting and personalizing things out appropriately so you're not bombarding them. But yeah. Sounds like sound advice. Thank you, Danielle. It was a pleasure having you on this episode. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. It was really great to meet you. <laughs>